Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Brenette, can you hear me okay? I can. can okay, you hear great. Me? Yep, I can hear you. Wonderful. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Farley, and I am one of JRSA's research associates. For those of you who may be less familiar, JRSA stands for the Justice Research and Statistics Association. And we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners, which at the core include directors of, um, and staff from state statistical analysis centers. So it is my pleasure today to welcome you all to our webinar on simple linear regression. And it will be presented by Dr. Renette Bachman from the University of Delaware. Uh, Renette is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice, and she is also co-author of numerous texts, uh, including Statistical Methods for Crime and Criminal Justice, and a co-editor of Explaining Crime and Criminology, Essays in Contemporary Criminal Theory. Um, and her most recent federally funded research was a mixed methods study that investigated the long-term trajectories of offending behavior using official data of a prison cohort released in the early 1990s. Um, so welcome, Renette. Um, and before we go any further, I do want to thank our partners um, at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping make this webinar possible. I would also like to cover a few logistical items. We will be recording today's session for future playback. The link to the recording will be posted on JRSA's website and is usually posted the day following the webinar. So it should be available tomorrow, if not by Monday. Today's webinar is being audio cast via both the speakers on your computer and teleconference. We recommend listening to the webinar using your computer speaker, speakers or headphones. To access the audio conference, select audio from the top menu bar and then select audio conference. Once the audio conference window appears, you can view the teleconference call-in information or join the audio conference via your computer. If you have any questions for the presenter or would like to communicate with JRSA staff, please submit all your questions to me, Erin Farley, using the chat feature on the right side of your screen. This, this session is scheduled for one and a half hours. If you have any technical difficulties, or get disconnected during the session, you can reconnect to the session using the same link that you used to join. You can also email any questions or technological issues to Jason Trask at jtrask at jrsa.org. In the last five minutes of today's webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey. The information that you provide will help us plan and improve future webinars and to meet our reporting requirements. And so that is it. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Ronette. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm Ronette, and I'm so thrilled to be here. Let me know. Um, I'm, I'm not screaming too loud, am I? Am I? I know I can actually respond, I guess. No, nope, you sound, yeah, okay. you sound great. Okay. I forgive you in advance. I've already taught a two-hour statistics class this morning, and I'm coming off of a two-week horrible cold and cough, so my voice may go here and there. I've got a cup of tea beside me. Um, and let me just say at the forefront that I am so honored to be here um, with you all today. I, before I came back to teaching, I was actually a statistician at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, so I worked closely with all the state SACs at the time, and um, I am just honored to be here. So thank you very much for having me, and um, I'm thrilled to be able to share uh, this information. It's a very exciting information, I think, and hopefully you will too, on um, ordinary least squares regression. Um, before I start, I'm going to assume that everyone in the audience already understands the basic of hypothesis testing. Um, and so I'm, if you have any questions during the talk, just let um, Aaron know and, and I'll answer them for you. I'm also very used to a teaching style that is uh, give and take without straight lecture, so I might um, almost uh, habitually stop and wait for somebody to respond, so forgive me for that. But when we get into the SPSS component where I'm actually showing you how to get this, I'm going to allow you to do stuff 
um, on your own just for like a brief 30 seconds because I believe in doing you actually cement learning rather than just sitting listening to somebody blather on. So how I'm setting this up is um, I have SPSS output within these PowerPoint slides so and then we're going to move to SPSS and I'll show you sort of how I, so I, I got them. So first we're going to concentrate on interpretation. So ordinary least squares regression is probably the most utilized um, statistical tool for analyzing relationships there is, not just in criminology and criminal justice, but across all the social sciences and hard sciences. Every time um, you calculate a, an insurance rate, for example, this is what they're, they're using, or the probability of um, something happening, recidivism or, or arrest rates. Ordinary least squares regression is a very versatile tool. So um, the dependent variable, however, is typically interval ratio, meaning that the numerical values can be added, subtracted, and multiplied and divided. They mean something. The independent variables typically can be about anything, although interval ratio or dichotomies are the most often utilized. And that's what we're going to stick with today. So um, i got to figure out how to use this. It's not going down. Oh, it is slowly. Forgive me. OK. So here, and I refer to IVs as X variables, independent variables as X variables, and dependent variables as Y variables. I bounce back and forth between saying IV and DV just to get the terminology there. But imagine we have, and I'm going to start with when both IVs and DVs are interval ratio where the numbers actually mean something. And this is just some hypothetical data. And I'm going to show you what actually correlation and regression is trying to do. If we have an X variable and Y variable like this, a very um, important tool that you look at first in examining the linear relationship between two variables is called a scatter plot. And as you can see on the screen here, the scatter plot, the independent variable plots along the horizontal axes, and the dependent or Y variable plots along the vertical axes. And so you can see from this hypothetical data that there, the linear relationship here is what we call a positive relationship. And that simply means that both variables are moving in the same direction. As the independent variable increases, so does the dependent variable in this case. In this next set of fictitional data, we have an independent and a dependent variable. And if we plot a scatter plot for these variables, we see a different linear pattern. In this case, on the horizontal axis, as the independent variable increases from low to high, we have a dependent variable that is actually decreasing. This is referred to as a negative relationship, not any connotation with negative, simply meaning that the variables are moving in an opposite direction. So as the IV increases, typically, on average, the dependent variable will um, decrease. And if you look at this next pattern of data, you see the x variable changing. And if you look across the values on y, the dependent variable, you notice that they're not changing at all. If we plotted these data, this is the line we would see, no relationship. And this is what linear regression and correlation also do. When there is no relationship, the line that can be drawn through the bivariate data points is actually flat line, in sort of synonymous with flat line in the medical term, no relationship. Now, all of these three typical, um, actually non-typical, but perfect relationships that I've shown you obviously don't exist in the real world. You've all worked with data. It's messy. Um, it more looks like a dartboard. These are some state-level data um, that I've brought down to illustrate relationships. And the first relationship we're examining here is, and it does not include the District of Columbia, so it states without DC. The independent variable along the x-axis here is um, percent of a state's population residing in rural areas, so percent rural in a state. And the de dependent variable along the y vertical axis is motor vehicle theft rates. And so what correlation and regression does specifically is try to um, quantitatively calculate the best fitting line that would go through that scatter of data 
and describe it in a linear way, and it would plot the best fitting line to describe that quantitative relationship. And if you had to draw a line through this scatter plot, um, now this is a time where I'd ask my class, what would it be? Um, so I'll answer it myself. It would be negative. The line I can see would be going through here. Can you see my uh, cursor here or not? Probably not. Aaron, can you see my cursor? I cannot see your okay, cursor. Okay, okay. So, um, so the line would be um, descending, indicating a negative relationship. As percents of the state's population living in rural areas increases, motor vehicle theft rates decrease. And that's what you would expect theoretically. Um, I grew up in a very rural area, and there's not a lot of people stealing tractors out there. So let's move on, um, and I want to sort of summarize what we see in scatter plots and the important things to know. First is um, the strength of the relationship. If you notice in this, back to the scatter plot, the closer the data points cluster around a line or a linear trend, that indicates the strength of the relationship. The other thing you want to notice, of course, is whether or not the relationship is positive or negative, whether there is a uh, ascending line or a descending line indicating the direction of the relationship. And the third and um, equally important thing you want to examine is whether or not there are any bivariate outliers. And I know you are aware of univariate outliers, but a bivariate outlier is simply that as well, only in the bivariate sense. It's some value or data point in your data that does not fall within the rest of the pattern or trend. So for example, here I've included the District of Columbia in my scatter plot with my previous uh, rural and motor vehicle theft rate scatter plot. And you can see that the District of Columbia has a very high motor vehicle theft rate, but it only has 0% of its population in rural areas. So there's nothing rural about it, and it's an, therefore a bivariate outlier. So these sorts of outliers can really significantly influence um, your analyses, and I'm going to get back to this in a second. Okay, so the first statistic that we're going to talk about is the standardized Pearson correlation coefficient. And this is the um, most beautiful um, standardized coefficient that can tell us in a standardized way the covariation between an x and a y variable. And some of you in the audience may look and see that it looks a lot like um, the denominator or the numerator for a standard deviation. That is, it's looking at the variation between the x variables, and it's also looking at the variation around the y variable. And it's based on the covariation, and the denominator then standardizes it so that you can compare correlations across different models. They mean something regardless of how the original IV or DV were measured. Let me give you a little chart to show you what I mean. Um, it is standardized to go from zero, which indicates no relationship, to positive one, which indicates a perfect positive relationship, which that first graph I showed you would indicate, all the way to negative one, which indicates a perfect negative relationship. Now, there are no perfect relationships, at least in our social world, of the phenomena we're interested in. So everything falls generally in between, but it's a standard rule that the closer to zero the correlation coefficient of R is, the weaker the relationship. Um, and so I've laid out these sort of willy-nilly adjectives to describe correlations in between 0 and 1. And remember, the positive and negative signs have nothing to do with indicating strength. They simply indicate the direction. So a, a correlation of 0.5 would indicate a moderate positive relationship a correlation of negative 0.5 would indicate a moderate negative relationship. So that's the beauty of the Pearson's correlation coefficient. Um, and this is SPSS correlation matrix output. And I've just simply dumped um, a couple of the variables, including the bivariate relationship I just showed in the scattergram. 
And because it's in matrix form, there's a diagonal going through the middle of the box that is indicating a correlation of one. And that simply means that it is correlating, for example, the first box tells you the correlation between murder and murder, which by definition is going to be one because it's a perfect correlation with itself. Because it's a matrix, it also means that it's a mirror image. The top of the matrix is a mirror image of the bottom of the matrix. So you only need to look at one port. The second, um, the second bunch of rows, I guess, in the first column indicate the murder rate and the percent individuals below poverty. This is still the state level data set. And you can see from the correlation coefficient there, Pearson's correlation, that it's a positive 0.62 indicating in a subjective sense a sort of moderate relationship, moderate positive relationship between percent poor and the murder rate in states. And the significance, and I'm assuming that you guys again understand what the significance means, it's basically doing a null hypothesis test. And the null hypothesis always states no relationship between whatever variables you're interested in. And in science, of course, we have to test this and either reject it or fail to reject it. And when we reject a null hypothesis, it means we can conclude that, in fact, these two variables are significantly related. And typically, the um, standard critical value or critical alpha or significance is 0.05. When I, just as a little hint, when I look at these significance levels, I ask myself, if we're willing to be wrong 5% of the time, that is correct 95% of the time, and I see an alpha of 0 0.003, that means this is telling me that we're going to be wrong less than 1% of the time. So we can safely reject the null in this case and conclude um, poverty does, in fact, increase rates of murder at the state level. Just a little summary in case some of you are fuzzy on hypothesis testing. So let's go down to the next uh, row, uh, robbery rate and murder rate, again, positively related. I'm going to go down again to percent rural and the murder rate just to highlight a negative correlation here. The correlation between uh, percent rural and the murder rate is negative 0.10. Now that is uh, fairly close to zero, so I would interpret that as a very weak relationship. And the significance, in fact, is 0.65, indicating we'd be wrong 65% of the time if we rejected. So we must fail to reject and conclude that percent of a state's population living in rural areas does not, in fact, affect the murder rate. Um, so that's an overview of the correlation matrix and how to interpret it. And I'm going to move on now to look at a few more scatter plots and, and get in these scatter plots, in these um, PowerPoints, I provided the R and the significance of R here as well. So this is what we just saw in the matrix. In fact, it is a positive relationship indicating states with higher rates of poverty also tend to have higher rates of murder. Um, this is percent living in rural areas and not the, rob not the murder rate, but the robbery rate. And this, too, is a moderate relationship indicated by R being negative 0.66. And it also is significant. So we could conclude that states that have higher populations living in rural areas also tend to have uh, lower rates of robbery, which is what you would expect given theories about social disorganization and um, the such. So let me move on here. Is the divorce rate. Now, the divorce rate is often used as an indicator of social disorganization, which uh, decreases collective efficacy in communities, theories say. So you would expect the divorce rate to be related to the burglary rate. But as you see in this scatter plot, the line that you draw is virtually flat because the scatter, if you had to draw a line that goes closest to all these spots, dots, as possible, it would essentially be flat. And that is confirmed by this correlation coefficient of almost zero. R is 0.05, that's almost zero. And the significance associated with that is 0.81, indicating you're going to be wrong almost 82% of the time. So 
this is indicating no relationship. Okay, so I've talked about correlation and the subjective adjective terms to describe correlation being weak, moderate, strong, etc., and whether or not they're significant. There's another more a precise way to interpret R, and that's R squared, otherwise known as the uh, very important coefficient of determination. I just call it R squared. Basically, it tells us specifically the proportion of the variation in the dependent variable Y that is being explained by the independent variable X. So it gives us a more precise way of interpreting R, and clearly, you only have 100% of your variation to explain in any given dependent variable. You want to explain as much variation as possible. And let me just say as a side note here, and I'm going to reiterate this when we get to individual level data, that aggregate level data like zip code, county, city, state, um, typically the, there is much less measurement error in aggregate level data so that the correlation and R squared coefficients are much higher than individual level data. When we have individual level data, I've rarely seen a correlation or an R squared that explains over 10% of the variation. So just an FYI, and I'm going to reiterate that in a minute. But let me go through interpreting these. So we've, we've already seen the poverty rate and murder uh, scatter plot, and we saw that they had a correlation of 0.62. R squared, which is simply literally the square of that correlation coefficient, or multiplying that by itself, is 0.38. When we multiply that by 100, it is interpreted as a percent of variation in Y explained by X. So in this case, we could say that 38% of the variation in murder rates in states can be explained by poverty rates. Remember, when you are interpreting um, Analyses, you always make reference to your variables and to your units of analysis, which uh, are how your variables are measured, which in this case are at the state level. So for the rate of robbery, we have a correlation of negative 0.66. Uh, R squared tells us 0.44, which means that 44% in this case, of the variation in the robbery rates can be explained by knowing a, a state's percent rural population, which is, again, pretty, pretty good. And we know that those are both significant. And then we have the divorce rate, which had an R of 0.05. And this gives us an R squared of 0.02. And so we can say the divorce rate explains only about 2% of the variation in rates of burglary at the state level. So again, this illustrates very uh, much more precisely in a quantitative way an interpretation of the correlation coefficient instead of saying, you know, weak, moderate, strong. So it's a very handy, handy tool. Now, this um, correlation and coefficient of determination are wonderful tools to examine strength of a relationship and they allow us to make comparisons and and sort of assessments of strength beyond significance which I'm going to show you in a minute now I'm going to move into the ordinary least squares and ordinary least squares regression line otherwise known as linear regression OLS is the formal term, and why is it called ordinary least squares? I'm going to tell you why, because it makes intuitive sense. When most of you learned about descriptive statistics like the mean and learned how to calculate the standard deviation, you learned that this different square, the sum of all of the x values um, subtracted from their mean, would be equal to zero if we sum them, because the mean is the perfect balancing score. That, what makes it so beautiful, um, and that's why it's so versatile as an analysis tool. But to quantify that variability around a mean in any distribution of x values, then you have to square those different scores to get a quantity. And that sum of those different squares, those least squares, will be the minimum variance you could possibly describe, and that's how of course, both the standard deviation and the, the variance in the standard deviation are calculated. 
Well, this too is what Ordinary Least Squares uses to draw the best fitting line through a linear scatter of data points, this beautiful um, balancing mechanism that the mean has. So let me take you through a little exercise. Here we have, um, we're changing now to units of analysis of students in middle school and high school. We have two variables. We have 20 students and we have the independent variable of age. So we have each student's age. And then we have the dependent variable, um, their self-reported delinquency score. And um, if we plot this out, you can see there is a nice linear positive relationship. As age increases for these, this sample of 20, so do the number of delinquent acts, as you would expect. Now, if you imagine, if we were to draw the best fitting line through this scatter of data, the best and most efficient way we could do that would be to calculate conditional Y scores, that is conditional rates of self-reported delinquency for each age. And those, that conditional Y score, mean of Y, would come closest to all other values of delinquency at any given age. That is exactly what the um, slope coefficient is doing when we calculate the ordinary least squares regression line. So it's actually creating these conditional values at every X score so that that line that it fits in that data is the absolute quantitatively best fitting line that could possibly describe that linear relationship. It's really cool. So I plotted these conditional Ys and you can see, <laughs> get out your little uh, rulers and see that they come closest to all the data points possible. And that's my little exercise to demonstrate to you why ordinary least squares is the best way we could ever summarize a linear relationship between two interval ratio level variables. So this is in fact the equation. And the equation on the top is um, using the symbols for the population parameters, alpha and um, beta. And on the side, I have the equation using the sample symbols, A and B. But what the regression equation actually is doing is predicting values of Y, the dependent variable, to a line. And that line crosses the Y axis at the um, constant or intercept level, and that's the symbol for alpha and A. And as such, that's just that line, that constant or intercept is just anchoring that line. What we're really interested in is the slope or B or beta up there. The slope tells us exactly how much Y, the dependent variable, increases or decreases for every one unit increase in the independent variable. And so you say, Ronette, well, that's all great. We already know from correlation that, you know, there's a positive or a negative relationship. What's so great about this? The great thing about ordinary early squares regression line is that it allows us to make predictions, specifically with how the variables are measured. So when you're doing uh, correlation, you also need regression. There are two sides of the same coin, and you need them both when you're describing linear relationships. So on this next slide, we have um, SPSS output. And this is, again, repetition, but I'm showing you the different ways you can get uh, these statistics. This is where the independent variable is percent below poverty in a state, and the dependent variable is the murder rate. And again, it's the state level data. The first box, you, uh, those of you who work in SPSS knows that, know that it increasingly gives you about, mm, I don't know, 70, 80 things that are useless. The first box up here just reiterates what the IVs and DV are. The model summary gives you correlation information, just like the correlation matrix does. So you have your R and your R squared 
and the adjusted R squared, which I'm going to talk about when we talk about multiple regression. For now, I'm just going to concentrate on the R and R squared. But one thing I want to note and put your um, listening ears on, in the regression output, uh, R never has a sign, positive or negative, and that will make sense when we get to multiple regression. It doesn't have a sign because in this, in this particular analysis of regression, you can have many independent variables down here besides poverty predicting a particular dependent variable. Some of those variables will be positively related to the v, DV, some of them may be negative. So this R never has a sign. So simply because it's positive now, um, don't infer that that is meaningful. It just gives you the value of R. So I'm not going to reiterate this interpretation. Already done that. This NOVA box here is the F test for the um, significance uh, null hypothesis test of whether the model, the regression model, is actually explaining a significant amount of variation in the dependent variable. And when you have a bivariate model, that is only one independent variable predicting a dependent variable, it's redundant with this, uh, the coefficient box t-test. So I'm not going to put uh, uh, spend any time explaining this ANOVA box either because it's redundant and I'll talk about that in a second. But for now, let's go to the coefficients box. <clears throat> and the constant is the intercept. SPSS labels its intercepts constants. Um, I don't know why, but that's what they label them. So I put arrows there to indicate that. The slope coefficient is the unstandard slope coefficient is under the same column, B, and it is positive 0.531. And so because there's only one independent variable in this model, we could also look back to the correlation up in the model summary box and know that that, too, should be positive. So the OLS regression equation that SPSS provides us for that data that we just saw in the scatter plot is the murder rate y is equal to negative 1.828 plus 0.53 times x. So you could insert any rate of poverty here for a state and predict the value of murder that you would obtain from this regression equation. I'm going to also interpret the slope coefficient b. So unlike the correlation coefficient here where you see it's 0.62, you can say, oh, that's small moderate explains 38% of the variation. With this slope coefficient, we can say specifically that for every one unit increase in the percent of a state's population living below poverty, murder rates also increase 0.53 units. So that gives us precision. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute how to use this for prediction. But let me highlight here. Um, there's also a significance test. You have a T value. T is used to test the null hypothesis that the coefficients here, the slope coefficient, is equal to zero. And of course, if a slope coefficient is equal to zero, it simply means there's no relationship. So that's the same null hypothesis that we're always uh, using in, in all of statistical tests. It's the exact same significance that we got with the correlation coefficient. Notice the significance of getting this t is 0.003. So we can safely conclude, at least at the 05 level, that there is a uh, significant relationship between poverty and murder rates. And notice that this significance, 0.003, is exactly like the significance of f above in the ANOVA box of 0.003. So these significance tests for the slope here and for the model summary here in the ANOVA box are identical when there's only one independent variable in the model. So you only really need to look at one. That, of course, will change when we look at multiple regression. Okay. Um, I'm going to move along. Uh, before, I want to highlight a couple of assumptions. and. <laughs> assumptions that we frequently violate, but let me just say that OLS regression is very robust, so it can take some violations pretty handily. 
But um, the first assumption, of course, is that the data were randomly selected. If they're not randomly selected, we shouldn't be doing probability theory to test hypotheses. We also assume that they're normally distributed. If you had um, very, very skewed distributions, that might cause problems. It's beyond the scope of this webinar to talk about them here. You're also assuming that the relationship is linear. Um, and that's also beyond the scope to talk about what you do when you have a nonlinear relationship. The other thing I want to highlight is this uh, word that you can use in Scrabble that will get you a lot of points. It's called homoscedasticity. And what that means is that you are assuming that the error, uh, which we call residuals, residuals are the distance between your actual data points and the regression line that is drawn. You assume that the residuals or the error component is constant across all values of the independent variable. So what does that mean? If I show you here, these, these are not raw data. These are actually scatter plots, residuals plotted. Um, and so you have in this first graph constant residual, that is constant error across all the x values. They're sort of consistent. There's not a lot of variation in the residuals. But in the second graph on the right side, you see there's much more error and the residual is much greater at higher values of x. So you can do a simple plotting of residuals on your x to see if, in fact, there is greater variance at different values of x. And if you have that, you probably are going to have a problem with homoscedasticity that you're going to have to deal with, which is, again, beyond this webinar. But for now, you can use it in Scrabble. OK, so as I said, prediction. The regression equation I've just uh, written here, this is exactly what we got from that SPSS output. And I remember that the correlation was 0.62. What we want to ask when you're presenting something to an audience, um, especially if you're using prediction tools, you don't want to present a, a value of y predicted in isolation. The question is always compared to what. So what I like to do for audiences to illustrate the effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable is to use a high and a low value um, within your independent variable to predict values of y. So what I've done here is predict murder, a murder rate, for a state with a low value of poverty, around 4%, and, um, and for a high value of poverty, around 24%. Now that, that, those high and low values of 4 and 24 may not necessarily exist in your data. They're, the low poverty rate is about that, um, and the high poverty rate is around 25%. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that your predicted, the predicted value that you obtain is going to be equal to that particular poverty rate, but it's telling you based on that whole regression equation and the scatter of the data, this is the best predicted value of the murder rate you could obtain. Um, and I use in, in this um, equation y hat. This y with a little hat on it, that's usually what we use to denote that it's a predicted value of not y, not the real value of y. So you can see here, for a predicted value of murder for a state with a very low poverty rate, say a poverty rate with 4% of its population living in poverty is 0.29. That's a very low rate of murder, 0.29. Wouldn't that be great? And then we have, uh, compared to what? the 24% rate of poverty, we plug that into the same regression equation using 24 as our x value instead of 4, and we get a much higher rate of 10.89. So that's the beauty of the regression equation. It allows us to make predictions. And you can bet this is what you know every insurance company is doing to predict your health insurance and your auto insurance and what financial analysts are doing all over right now to predict what's going to happen uh, to the market. And what people all over in SACS are doing to predict uh, rates of recidivism and rates of crime and um, rates of showing up for trial and so on. So let's move on. 
Okay. I've put in this PowerPoint slide so you have um, a mechanism to go back and uh, relearn what I'm going through rather quickly here. I'm highlighting again here in this slide that the correlation coefficient in the model summary, again, never shows a sign. In this case, we have the dependent variable of the robbery rate in states and the independent variable of percent living in rural areas. And I'm going to start with the uh, regression coefficient and the regression line. Just like the one above for murder, we see here that in this case, robbery, the dependent variable, is equal to the intercept called the constant here of 179.468 plus negative 2.507 times x, which happens to be 80% rural. So notice that the coefficient here, the slope, is negative. This tells you that this correlation up here in the model summary, because there's only one independent variable, this correlation coefficient should also be negative, which it would be if you had a correlation matrix, if you ran that in SPSS. But again, it's always showing uh, no sign here, simply because it can accommodate multiple uh, relationships. So let's interpret this coefficient, this slope coefficient. This tells us that for every one unit increase in uh, percent population living in rural areas in states, there's a corresponding 2.507 unit decrease in robbery rates. Decrease because it's a negative relationship. So you look at the significance of this. Again, the T test is testing this null hypothesis that states no relationship between rural population and rates of robbery, or that the slope in the population is actually equal to zero. And we would be wrong less than 1% of the time if we rejected that. So we can clearly, in, on safe uh, grounds, conclude that there is a significant relationship. States with higher rates of rural population also tend to have lower rates of robbery. Okay. Um, and now let's go to the divorce rate. And this is what I want to illustrate. Um, look at this OLS regression equation. You have, this time we're predicting burglary rates, burglary rates with the divorce rate in states. And you have Y, the burglary rates are equal to 16, 17.778 plus 12.751. So for every one unit increase in the divorce rate, the burglary rate increases 12.75 units. Now, so you say, Ronette, look at that coefficient. It's 12.75 and, whoops, sorry, going the wrong way. And look at that percent rural coefficient back here, it's only two. This highlights what I said um, a little while ago, that you cannot compare the value of a slope coefficient across models or even across the same variables across models because it is measured specifically to determine the change in your particular dependent variable at one unit increase of your independent variable. So this coefficient was much smaller than this, but this is not significant. This is a very, very weak relationship. So what I'm trying to bring home is never compare the size of a slope coefficient. It tells you nothing about its strength or significance. It's measured specifically to how your IV and DV are measured. Okay, so again, this relationship between divorce and burglary rates we already determined back when we were looking at the correlation is very weak. It explains less than 1% of the variation in burglary rates. And this T value here in its corresponding significance says we're going to be wrong almost 82% of the time if we reject the null that says there's no relationship. So we have to fail to reject the null and conclude that divorce rates have no relationship, have no linear effect on rates of burglary in the state. 
Okay, let's move on. Okay, at the beginning I said that OLS is extremely robust and can handle, um, even though it was designed to determine linear relationships between two variables, it can handle dichotomies, but the dichotomies have to be coded zero and one for them to be very uh, easily interpreted. So there are many, many times when you have a dichotomous independent variable. There are also many more times when you have an ordinal level of measurement or a variable that has so little variation that it just makes more sense to dichotomize it into zero and one. Um, and I'm gonna show you those in a second. For now, a dichotomy has to be coded zero and one. And um, I'm gonna first start with predicting murder using a southern location variable coded zero for states that are in the non-south and one for states that reside in the south according to the U.S. Census. And I'm not going to show you a scatter plot of this relationship obviously because there's no scatter. There's just a zero and one. But you can interpret correlation similar to any other correlation. This correlation would indicate sort of a weak to moderate 0.44 relationship. And R squared tells us that um, when multiplied by 100, 19.3% of the variation in murder rates can be explained by a state's uh, southern location. Now why is this? Well. A lot of reasons, there is a, a lot of gun ownership, there's the culture of honor, um, many reasons why people think the South has higher rates of homicide than other regions, and here we see that it does in fact explain variation in rates of murder. Now let's look at the regression equation. The regression equation is, uh, I've put down here in the slide, and notice that this coefficient is just like any other coefficient. But when you interpret it, we have been interpreting these slope coefficients as if uh, they are interval ratio. That is, for every one unit increase in x, what happens to murder? In this case, we know that there is no interval ratio variable. It's simply a variable that's coded for states zero, states that reside in the non-south, and one for states that reside in the south. So how you interpret a coefficient like this is, or a dichotomous, there are a couple different ways. What I always do is start with the comparison of the zero category. So compared to states in the non-south, the murder rate increases 2.419 units for states that are located in the south. That's exactly how you interpret it. And I can show you if we use this um, regression equation for prediction exactly what that means mathematically. So remember that states, and so when you interpret a dichotomous coefficient, you have to do it with how the variables are coded, how which um, is coded zero and which value is coded one. But if I use this um, zero for states in the non-south and plug in zero, in this regression equation, you will see that the zero cancels out that 2.4 and the predicted rate of murder is then just what the constant is or the intercept, 4.61. Now, if I plug in the value of x for states that reside in the south and they are coded one, that murder rate increases exactly by 2.419 units and the predicted rate of murder now becomes 7.029. So either way, um, I hope this illustrates that uh, when you interpret a slope coefficient for a dichotomy, you can't say for every one unit increase in x because x only goes zero to one. So be very careful when you interpret those. And so you can say here, let me go back to this equation, the significance of this is just at the line, 0.052, and my students say, well, is that significant? I say that's significant. If it's 0.056, then you might have 
Um, but you can also say at a one-tailed level, and I'm not going to get into one-tailed and two-tailed tests, that that's significant. So what does that mean? You can conclude that states in the south have higher rates of murder than states in the non-south, and that's, and that's all you can say. So let me go on to, um, I want to bring in some other data, some um, homicide defendant data. And because I want to try some um, regression analyses when the units of analysis are individuals. So these data were actually obtained from BJF. They're a little old, but they still are very useful. It's homicide defendant data. The units of analysis are murder defendants from 75 of the largest standard metropolitan statistical agencies. And the dependent variable that I'm using here is um, sentence length received for convicted defendants. So all of the uh, individuals in this particular model were all convicted, and the, interval, uh, the dependent variable is incarceration term in days. The dependent variable is another dichotomy, whether or not the trial was by jury or whether it was a plea. So those of you in the SACs know by um, your knowledge that obviously pleas you're going to assume are going to have lower incarceration terms than those that went to trial and were convicted. So let's go through this regression equation for these individual level and notice that the R is point, the correlation coefficient and the model summary is 0.273 and that's on the weekend of the R spectrum. R squared indicates that 7.5% of the variation in the sentence length received is explained by whether or not um, the trial was by jury or by plea bargain. Now, you can say, well, Ron, that, look, though, that's teeny weeny, that's less than 10% of the variation explained. And I will say that is uh, pretty good for an individual level unit of analysis. There's so much any of you who have looked at sentence lengths know that they're extremely variable um, and there's a lot of measurement error. And so this is a fairly good model summary for an individual level data set. So let's move on. And again, we see the coefficient box and I'm putting out the OLS regression equation here. Sentence length in days, the dependent variable is equal to about almost 9,000, 8,947.36 plus 9374.4 times X, our independent variable, which is whether or not the trial was by jury or a plea. So how to interpret this slope? Compared to, remember, we have to know what zero is coded and what one is coded. In this particular case, plea bargains are coded one and jury trials are coded, I mean plea bargains are coded zero, forgive me, and jury trials are coded one. So compared to plea bargains, compared to defendants who pled their cases, defendants who were convicted in a jury trial on average had an increase of 9,374 uh, days added to their sentence. Okay, no surprise. Is that significant? Very. Um, the significance is 0. 0.000. Um, now, there, uh, SPSS, I don't know what Excel displays, but SPSS only displays three decimal places. So that doesn't mean that you're going to be wrong 0% of the time or that you, you're uh, on the other side of the coin going to be right 100% of the time. It just means if you, if I were in SPSS, and I'll show you in a second, and clicked on this, there are about 10 decimal places out there, so there's a one out there somewhere. It just means you're very, very significant. You're going to be wrong less than 0.1% of the time. So that's a very significant relationship. And if I illustrate this using my prediction, just like I did for the murder rates, so I plug in zero here when I'm predicting the sentence length for somebody who pled their case 
and I divide by 365 the number of days in a year. The predicted sentence length for a defendant who pled their case and was uh, would be about 24 years or 8,947 days. In contrast, I can plug in my X value of one, indicating the defendant actually went to a jury trial, and that predicts a sentence length for that particular defendant exactly 9,374 days longer, or about 50.2 years. So using regression like this to illustrate the effects of a particular independent variable on what you're trying to predict is very, very illuminating. Um, and I think I'm going to do, oh, I'm actually not. I'm going to talk a word about outliers here. Um, remember I said back in the very beginning of this talk, looking at bivariate scatter plots, that scatter plots tell you um, three things, the direction of the relationship, the strength of the relationship, how close those lines are actually clustered around a linear line, and any, any idiosyncrasies or outliers that you have. This is real data that I just pulled down. Um, the incarceration, that's state level data, but includes DC now. It's incarceration rate as the independent variable and the murder rate as the dependent variable. And in this first scatter plot, I've included the District of Columbia. And just like it did with percent rural, it's not behaving itself. And that's, that's kind of happens with DC frequently. Um, but I want you to, I want to illustrate what happens to the value of the correlation coefficient when we included it in. The correlation coefficient for incarceration and rates of murder is 0.49 with DC in. And that's sort of, you know, weak to moderate, but look what happens when we take DC out. The correlation, as you see on the scatter plot on the right with the correlation noted above, dramatically increases to 0.68. So you, when you're analyzing your data, um, and believe me, um, <laughs> you want to make sure that you don't have anything unduly influencing the results, either, either unduly influencing it so it, you get the results that you expect or the, ex or the results that you don't expect. So that's very, very important to sort of highlight on uh, inspecting your scatter plots. And that goes for the univariate level as well. If you have a, a very, very, very high, for example, in the sentence length data, all of the people who got the death were coded some astronomical sentence length. I can't remember what it was, but all of those people who were sentenced to death are like way, way up there. Um, and that's a completely different sentence and it really messed up. So you're, you really have to inspect your data from the very beginning. Um, there's a little, so I'm going to go now to SPSS. Does anybody have any questions? I can't, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go, f oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. She needs to speak up closer to her mouth. She is coming through fine on her oh, end. Yeah. yeah, you're okay. good. There aren't okay. any okay, additional good. questions, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so how to do this? I need a quick start, and I need to share my desktop. Yay, technology is so great when it actually works. I also have, um, I have a handout, if you will. I don't know how to get it. I will uh, uh, give it to Erin. Okay. Um, and it, it's, I should have had it prior. I'm sorry, but it's going to take you through what I'm doing here now. It's been a rough week here on this end. So let me just go through here. This is SPSS, and I know S Excel does this as well, too. Um, I am using SPSS just because it's more user friendly and you can it, it's synonymous with the output that I showed in the PowerPoints. Um, I have do, two data sets up here. Okay, it's not letting me go in here to this. Maybe it will let me go here. Okay, it is. Okay, so this is what an SPSS window looks like. And I'm first going to take you through um, a couple of scatter plots to show you how to get them. And scatter plots are wonderful if you have um, aggregate level data. Individual level data doesn't always show trends so well, but it's still another important tool to use to see if there are any uh, extreme outliers. 
So the first data set is the state level data. Instead of the sample of 20 that I used for the PowerPoint illustrations, this is all of the data and it doesn't include DC. So the first relationships I'm going to look at, and when, when you're in, I can't, I guess I can't toggle like that, I have to go through here. When you have um, SPSS, it spits all of its output into an output window, and so I'm going to keep both the output window and the data window up here. Um, and it is very user friendly, and there's always a help menu uh, if you get help. In fact, it, there's not only a help menu, but it, it gives you sort of interpretation tools. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the relationship in states between mobility and the robbery rate. Now, this is another indicator of, I think I mentioned social disorganization earlier. Social disorganization um, uh, is a theory that says when communities are disorganized, um, people moving in and out, divorce rates, etc., that they have, uh, the residents in those communities have less collective efficacy and therefore cannot monitor and uh, uh, socially control their residents. So one indicator of social disorganization that criminologists have frequently used is mobility. And the census, the census measures this as asking residents, have you moved in the last five years? And this is percent moved in 2010. These data are actually 2014. So it's, it's capturing the mover rate or the mobility rate, if you will. So to get a scatter plot, um, every graphical tool in SPSS is housed under the graphs um, icon here, and you see here you have a whole range of graphing options. I personally hate pie charts and by charts, but scatter plots and box plots are great things. Histograms, okay too. Um, the scatter, you have several different options. I'm just going to do a simple scatter. You can do matrix. If you did a matrix scatter, it would be exactly like the correlation matrix that I described, only instead of showing all the different correlations, it would actually show all the different scatter plots, which they're teeny weeny, so it's hard to examine. So I just stick to a simple scatter. You would define it, and in the, again, you see all of these options. The x-axis is the horizontal axis, and remember that is where we traditionally place the independent variable. So here I have this variable called per moved, that's percent moved in a state. And for the y-axis, which is where you place the dependent variable, we're going to have the robbery rate. So I place that here. Now I could set my markers just by the state name, but that just gets messy. So I'm just going to not, I'm just going to let SPSS give me the default little dots that it does. And then I click OK. And then it clicks me over to the output window, and there is my scatter plot. And if I had to draw a line in this scatter plot, it would be pretty hard for me. It's, um, uh, again, the best fitting line I could draw would probably be almost flat, right? To come closest to all those points, especially that high point, that high robbery rate. Um, it, it would be probably flat. So let's examine um, another one to compare. I'm going to go back to legacy dialog, back to scatter, and instead of doing move, I'm going to again do the percent rural because I know that's very related to um, robbery. Where is that? There we go. Okay. And this, you can see a, a very visible negative relationship. As percent rural population increases, robbery rates tend to decrease. And that's how you get a scatter plot. And you can do a lot of neat, you can click on it and make the dots different. It's very, very helpful. And you can also uh, input a regression line right in there if you want. So that tells us visually, I've inspected this, and there's nothing that really gets my eye that's a trouble spot. So I'm going to go on now and look at the correlation between these uh, variables. I can take that from the um, output window, or I can go back, and you can get all of the options in any window, generally. 
To get a correlation, and we're simply looking at bivariate correlations today, you go under the Analyze menu. Everything that has to do with analysis is under the Analyze menu. Um, everything that's under transforming computing variables, recoding variables is under the transform menu. So I'm going to go under analyze and down to correlate and over to bivariate. And this simply gives me not an independent and dependent variable box because the correlation function gives you the correlations between every variable you put in this box in a matrix form. And that will be meaningful when we get to multiple regression. Um, but for now, I'm simply going to put in my percent moose. I'm going to put in my um, percent rural. And I'm going to put in my robbery rate. And, I'm, and the default is for Pearson's correlation. The default is also for a two-tailed test of significance. And I'm going to click OK. And then you see uh, the correlation matrix, just as I had it in the PowerPoint. And so you can see there's that diagonal where everything is correlated with itself. And if I go down here and I look at robbery, the very final column, I see it has a correlation with percent moved of negative 0.09. And if we were to interpret that, from the 0 to 1 correlation stance, it would be very close to 0, almost no relationship, very, very weak. That significance is 0.52, um, indicating we cannot reject the null hypothesis, and so we conclude there's no relationship between mobility and rates of robbery. States that have high rates of mobility do not have higher rates of robbery than other states. And now let's look at this correlation with percent rural and robbery, and we see, in fact, the Pearson correlation is negative 0.53, as we suspected from this correlation scatter plot here. Um, and that's a moderate relationship, and it is significant, 0.000. And what I'm going to do to show you now, remember I said during the uh, PowerPoint that SPSS only displays three decimal plays, but if I click on this, um, you can see that there is uh, actual integer values way beyond this. So it's not, you know, you're not risking 0% error or you're not 100% certain here. SPSS only displays three decimal places. Okay. Okay, so you could easily square these, these correlations. This correlation of 0.09, if you squared that, you would get less than 1% of the variation explained in robbery rates by mobility. If you squared this, um, negative 0.533, you would get about 28.4% or 0.284, indicating 28.4% of your variation in robbery rates can be explained by rural population in the state. Um, now I want to um, let's see. I want to go back and toggle. I think I'm. How much time do we have, Aaron? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, it's three eleven right now. So okay. goodness gracious. Okay, let me go through one on an individual level, and then I'll open it up to questions. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Okay, I'm gonna. I have up here also this defendant this homicide defendant data. And I'm going to do a dichotomy here. And this time I'm going to do it in a regression so you can see the, the regression output. One of the, in, in SPSS2, there's data view and there are variable view. So here are all my variables. One of the things, one of the legal factors we know that affects, in addition to other the uh, uh, defendant had a jury trial or pled is victim provocation. And we know that um, defendants who can claim somehow victim provocation that the victim precipitated or self-defense in some way, that they uh, may, the research question uh, would be, do they actually get more lenient sentences than defendants who don't? 
So we have a dependent variable here called prison time. It's the same variable I used in the PowerPoint slide, which is, I'm going to um, make this larger so you can see the label. It's incarceration term in days. And we have a dependent variable or an independent variable called victim provocation, which is called provoke. And so I'm going to put this in a regression. And so I go under Analyze and Regression and notice that back when I was in grad school, there were like one or two types of regression. Now there are many, many different kinds of regression based on different types of problems with data. We are using linear regression. Linear regression is the ordinary least squares regression. So you click on that and you get uh, the uh, similar dependent and independent box that you might be familiar with. The dependent variable, again, is going to be my prison time, the actual prison time that defendants were sentenced. And my independent variable is a, a dichotomy indicating whether or not there was provocation, that the defendant claimed provocation. It's called provoke. And it's coded zero if defendants did not claim provocation and one if they claimed provocation. So if you think about that, if they claim provocation and you think that those defendants are going to get linear sentences, you would assume that your coefficient is going to be negative, right? So let's see what happens. Say OK. And we get that regression output that I showed you in the PowerPoint slide. Again, you have to remember here that provocation is coded for all defendants. Defendants that did not claim provocation are coded zero, and if they claim provocation or some sort of um, victim precipitation, they're coded one. The R summary is 0.23. That's weak. R squared tells us that 5.4% of the variation in sentence length can be explained by whether defendants claim provocation. But again, let me just reiterate that this is pretty doggone good for an individual level data set. Now let's go down to the um, model summary and the coefficients, I mean, not the model summary. And you see victim provocation, as we expected or guessed, it's a negative coefficient. So I'm going to pop up this, um, my little worksheet here. Hopefully you can see that. And I'm going to go down to how I get, can you see this? Erin, can you see it? Yes, I can okay, see it. Excellent. So what I've done in this Word file is show you um, exactly how I took the regression equation from this output. You have y, which is your sentence length, equals your intercept, about 17,000 days, plus negative 10,100 days or so. So interpreting that, Compared to defendants who did not claim victim provocation, sentence lengths for those murder defendants who claimed victim precipitation or provocation were decreased by 10,100 days. So you can use that for prediction, as I have here in this little uh, Word file. So they, they get about 26 years less. If you use this for prediction, you can say defendants who claim provocation got about um, 26 years less sentence length than those who claim provocation. Um, and I could go on, but goodness gracious, I have 317. I have so much more to share. Um, so I, Aaron, you tell me what to do now. Well, we can if um, we can open it up and see if anybody has questions on what you've discussed so far. Um, Should I stop sharing my desktop and go back? Yeah, I think so. Uh, in case, let's see if anybody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing any pop up right now. Do you want me to go on with another example? I, we also have to stop five minutes. I was told to do that poll. Yeah. Thing, um, whatever that is. Is there anything that you just want to wrap up, and then we can um, 
Could go you go to the back poll? to the slide? Here's a question. Could you go back to the slide before the DC outlier slide in the PowerPoint? Mm hmm Okay, I'm gonna go okay. Uh, back to the slide in the PowerPoint. I don't know what oh wait, back before the DC outlier? Sorry. Yep, okay, before. Hi. Got it, yep. This one? Whoops, this is coded one, mistake. <laughs> that was a mistake. Is that maybe what he caught, he or she caught? This is bad. That should be coded one, not coded ten. My bad. Yeah, I can't. Uh, this is run. Oh, wait, here we go. I see the questions now. Okay. Can everybody hear me out there? Okay, it's not 10. It was coded 1, not 10. I'm sorry. That's a, my, state, my mistake in getting these PowerPoints. Bad. Good catch. I'll change that. Oh. Yeah, so we will we will send a copy of that Word document to yeah. all participants. There's another question. Can you show us how to code the dichotomous variables? You mean to actually code them in SPSS? Yeah, is that what they want to code them? As? I I absolutely will. Um, and that's a helpful thing to know how to do. Uh, I'll go back to Quick Start. Okay. Yes, okay. And that's a very, and this is a great learning opportunity too, because in this homicide defendant, remember I said sometimes there are natural dichotomies like gender, but sometimes you have cases where um, you want to dichotomize because it's not linear. There's a variable in here called prior convictions. Um, prior, 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 prior convictions. And if you can you see my screen now, it's coded zero for no prior convictions, one for one, two for two, three for three, and four for four or more. Um, okay, it's not letting me get off of here. Okay. Problem. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh, Jason, this is not letting me get out of here. I'm sorry, I can't do anything. I'm just going to move that, but it won't let me do anything until it lets me get yeah, There we I, go, there we go. Okay, yep. Yeah, I was going to say, that's in the SPSS, not the program. So I you're gonna know. Have to <laughs> okay. I'm going to run a frequencies of this prior conviction variable. And uh, so you see, 67% of these murder defendants had no prior convictions. And so if you use this in a, as an interval ratio level variable, it would really be, uh, it would not empirically, it would be a mess because you would have all these zeros and then a few people trailing out to 10% having four or more. It's just not a linear, normally distributed variable. So I can see here that I have no priors is coded zero and one, two, three, four, four for four or more. So that's my, that's how the variable is originally coded. If I were an analyst, I'd say I can't use that in a regression, so I'm going to dichotomize it. Empirically, it makes sense to dichotomize it. Theoretically, it makes sense too. Um, we typically want to know the difference between uh, sentence length from somebody who had no priors compared to those who had one or more. So to recode this, I'm going to go under transform, recode, and word to the wise, never, 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 never recode a variable into the same variable here, this option, you will lose it. Um, you always want to retain your original coding, so I always recode into a different variable. So I click on recode different variable. This is what the window looks like. The input variable is your original variable, which is, in my case, prior convictions. And the output is what you're going to name that. I'm just going to call it priors. And it allows you to give a label so that you know what it actually is. It's um, any priors, priors versus no priors. And then you go under this 
a menu called Old New Values. The first thing, and so this is sort of a dictionary you're building to tell SPSS. It's much more user friendly than Excel. The first thing I always do, even if I know there are no missing data, is I say everything system or using missing is still going to be system or user missing. So you click on that, click on that, and then you add that, and it creates a data dictionary that SPSS is going to use to recode the new variable. So my priors, I had zero was for no priors. And notice along this left column here that there are many different ways to recode a variable. So here, the zero is still going to be zero in my new variable. So I, zero is still going to be zero. My new value is still zero, and I add that to the data dictionary. Now notice that there are different ways I could achieve my mission of coding one, two, three, four as one. I could do a range, one to four is one. Um, I could simply do one equals one, two equals one, three equals one. The easiest, and that's always the best thing to do, is range to the highest. That means the lowest value through the highest value, and you put in your lowest value, in this case, the lowest to uh, the lowest to the, the other one is the reverse. I won't go into that. So for this, you're saying the value two through the highest value in this particular variable, which we know is four. So all those cases where you have two or higher, I'm going to call in this new variable one and I add that to my dictionary. And that's all I need. So that is going to create, then I hit continue, and SPSS has this um, sort of mechanism to make sure you really want to do this. It has a change button. You have to click change before it does anything, before you click OK. Hit change, and SPSS will read that dictionary you just gave it. Hit OK. And now you don't see it, but you see it's taken this command. And if you go back, SPSS, whenever you create or recode a new variable, always puts that variable at the bottom of your variable list. So that's my new variable. I can also add values to it under this values command. Um, I'm going to click on that. And so zero is no priors. Um, one is one or more priors. Whoops, hold on. Okay, and then that can be labeled now on my output. You always, always, always want to do a frequency and compare it to your original variable to make sure that it recoded correctly because in my life, about 10% of the time it doesn't. So we see here that in fact, um, I have the original 66.9% that are coded zero, and now I have 22% coded one or more. So that's how I would code uh, that dichotomy. I, I hope that answered the question. Aaron? Yeah, yep. Um, yeah, I think that um, answered the question. And if we have any, we're running out of time, and so let's just check and see if we have any other big, big questions. Um, if not, we will open the polls. Is there a way to go back to the the screen or, or Jason, if you can see it? Okay. All right, I think we're good. So with that then, um, we just opened the polls. So if everybody can take a few minutes to complete that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, I would t like to take a moment to, again, thank Renette, um, as well as everybody in the audience for joining us today. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, and if anybody does think of any questions, you know, feel free to um, email, on, um, email them to myself, Aaron, um, or Jason, and we will pass them on to Renette and we can answer them for you. You can if anything you can, comes to mind. You can email me directly to Ronette, oh, R O N E T, at, at udel, U D E L dot E D U. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions too. Oh, great. Wonderful. And, and then we do have um, 
an additional um, regression webinar that Ronette is um, presenting next month. And so I hope everybody um, has a chance to register for that one as well. And thank you. Are we logging, are we going away now? I think so, I think it's okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. thank you again, Ronette, I appreciate it. You bet, Erin, thank you so much. It's been a divine pleasure. Have Wonderful. a fantastic night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, for those of you who are still on, uh, I think there's about 24. We've lost a bunch of people, but it does look like there were a couple questions that maybe for some reason were not popping up on my screen. And so we may take um, a moment if there are any big outstanding questions um, to add those um, onto, um, you know, um, an additional document that we will post on the JRSA website. Thank you. What? No. Oh, really? Yeah, it's great. Um, but her, it was that her, so that was her microphone, so we're going to have to deal with that next time. Yeah, she's got to quit moving around so much. Or like she's bumping it or something. You know, she, it's funny. It was flawless. It was in the, uh, it was flawless in the, yeah. in all the walkthroughs, so I think she was either moving around okay. or something. Okay. Right. You heard it, Tim. Yeah. It's like, you could kind of see that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Can you hear that? Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 